Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Jordan, I'm just reiterating that we've got summer break next week, and so this will be deferred for not next Monday, but the following Monday as well. We're pick Thanks for the answer. We're picking up here in step 25. This is the third uh, look into John Climacus writing about humility, as he calls it, on the destroyer of the passions, most sublime humility, which is rooted in spiritual feeling. Uh, it's an interesting title because he's emphasizing that you can feel it and it's of the spirit. You can discern this sublime humility. Um, Guido, would you read uh, points 31? I've skipped ahead here. Um, 31, 32, 33, please. Yes, I will. We who wish to understand must not cease to examine this. And if our soul is sufficiently perceptive to realize that our neighbor is better in every respect than we are, then the divine mercy is near us. It is impossible for snow to burst into flame. Still more difficult is it for humility to dwell in an unorthodox person. This is something which the pious and faithful achieve, and then only when they have been purified. Most of us call ourselves sinners, and perhaps really think it, but it is indignity that tests the heart. The heart. So that's a big comment there, indignity that tests the heart. Uh, at this point, we're seeing John Climacus starting to talk about how, do we, how does one discipline oneself? How does one learn about uh, the things that will rob us of humility and the things that will nurture holy humility in us? And a couple of points that stand out for me here is um, the... The idea that in, the, in point number 32, this is something which the pious and faithful achieve and then only when they have been purified. And so we, we are given the instruction here that there is a process of purification. What does that look like in your life? And can you nurture it? Can you set yourself up for purification? Purification sounds like, oh, no, I'm not going to go into one of those things again. Oh, no, no. And you backpedal. You know, purification sounds like uh, you're descaling all of the things that you love off your surface, and it's going to be a painful event. And we do need to walk side by side with Jesus' statement that says that the Father will prune you so that you produce more fruit, better fruit. But again, usually the pruning is one of those things that we're not going to step up to. You know, someone says, hey, we're having a pruning on Friday. Who wants to Who wants to join us? You know, come on. You, you know, you, you've got nobody turning up. You know, even if you give away free chicken, you know, no one will turn up. It's not one of those things that we volunteer for. But if you can turn your heart to volunteering for it, then you'll find that you get the spiritual power to actually agree with the Father's way of being the Father. And this is what he's trying to do with us. He's trying to make us into replicas of himself with his character. We'll never be the creator Father. We'll never be the uncreate source of all being. We're just, we're not created. We're, well, for a start, we're created. <laughs> so that kind of <laughs> knocks that one on the head <laughs> straight away to be the uncreate. I guess that was Lucifer's problem. How can you be the uncreate when you are a created person? But when we, when we are able to take on what in our early years was a negative, it happened to us because bad things happened to us. I'm listening to a recording right now of, of a really wonderful book. And in it, this bad thing happens after bad thing, after bad thing, after bad thing, after bad thing. It just goes on and on and on. And you can see the shaping of this child has been shaped by all of the bad things. And after a while, you simply disconnect 
from the sources of, of those bad things. I remember in my own life disconnecting from my parents at the age of 12. I, I physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually divorced myself from them. And it never returned. You know, there was a, like, they crossed the line, I crossed the line, and that was it. And so you see in these, in these early years, the savagery that attacks us, and we ourselves either get crushed by that. I remember as a little boy at school, um, we, had, we had a family who had adopted a, a daughter and a girl. A daughter and a boy, a son, because they were brother and sister. And when I was 13 years old, the daughter hung herself. And within, I think, about 18 months, the boy himself also killed himself, probably out of grief. But it's something that you don't, you don't really expect. I grew up in a, in a home with a very violent mother, but I just thought that was life, and that, as you do as a kid. And so many of these things that terrorize us and that, that um, are, are afflictions upon us by other people, not by our own choosing, but by other people, we adapt to those, but sometimes they crush us and they kill us. And at other times, and, and this girl, these two kids' family, I think, were blameless. They were, they were models of our town society. But there was something obviously going on in the mind of the children themselves. Perhaps they felt a little bit different from all the other children in our class and in, in, in the case of the boy in his class too, he was two or three years younger. Um, and so when you think about this, this process of being insulted to the nth degree by people with with no sense of respect for you, no dignity for you, and, and very little dignity for themselves, you realize that this is hurt afflicting other people with their own kind of hurt. And as you grow older, the shaping that's happened to you is going to stay material. It's going to keep shaping your decisions until you get some semblance of actual spirituality that's not rooted in the church, not rooted in pastors and priests and nuns and monks and, and people, but actually rooted in God and that you have got a sense of access to God because you are of God, you are God's. And that takes God to get that message through to you. A person can get that message through to you, but on a bad hair day, that person will look like Satan himself. And so you you, you, can't, you can't have everything put into the egg basket of another human being. You've got to have actual God. And it's only then that you've got the opportunity to bear good fruit as a result of that material pruning that's gone on in your life. And God's got this wonderful, wonderful scripture in Joel 2, book of Joel, chapter 2. And, and God says, I will restore to you all of the things that the hopper has eaten, that the grasshopper has taken away from you, that the thief, basically, thief stole from you. I intended it for you, but the thief in the world stole it from you. I will restore that to you. Now, this is something that you just read it and you think, oh, good for them. You know, somebody had a nice word for them in their day until you realize that this is a promise of God. And the promise of God is he's fully aware how brutalized you were. He's fully aware how ostracized you were. He's fully aware of what happened to you mentally, physically, sexually, in your family, in your school, in your social life, in your church life, if you had one. Fully, fully aware of all of that. And he's probably offered help at the time but it hasn't gotten through because of the, the, the measure of violence that is wrought against your very, very tender heart. And it's only if a person can survive that that they then come into being an adult and they still carry not just the reflection but the dynamic fire of that hurt still in them. 
It's not that they've somehow processed it over the course of time and just said, oh, it's okay, you know, he was a drunk, you know, who cares? No, no, it's very, very active. It's still, it's still a virulent virus. And it comes out every now and again. When you push a person and their back's against the wall, they will spit that venom right back at you. It's, it's there and alive. Nothing's processed. So it's only when the person is able to come to God, the therapist, God the healer, God the restorer. There's a beautiful uh, expression within um, Orthodox Christianity, and we've got a three-volume set here that Sister Irini purchased, um, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful read. And the guy's thesis is on salvation, the healing process. God the healer takes a person and brings them into the salvation of Christ. And it isn't a one-off, oh yeah, you're all fixed, everything's hunky-dory now at all. It's the start of the creation of the new person, the new man, the new woman in God, in Christ. And the healing process, which is the restoration process of going through every single one of those violences against the human heart and then growing above and beyond that to produce spiritual fruit. You can't build spiritual fruit that's going to last when the trunk of the tree is so rotten and it's never been healed, it's never been patched, it's never been sheltered, it's never been, never been um, given its, itself in great strength again. And so we, we find here that as, as John Climacus is writing, this is something which the pious and faithful achieve. Well, there's lots of fi pious and faithful people who will, who will shoot your legs off you know, as, as quick as look at you. So they need the next bit. And then only when they have been purified. Now, my father's with me saying, now it's time to give them a little experience of that. Because the purification that is God's purification is partly the born again experience. But the born again experience can be, can be swept away from a person fairly quickly. The main thrust of it is that a person can come into God can cry into Jesus with their, their wounds. And Jesus the healer, not necessarily God the healer, but Jesus the healer, the person, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that Jesus who did those miracles, did that healing, did that restoration in people 2,000 years ago. When you cry into him personally, and you demand of him that he receive you, then you'll find that there is a purifying element. And the Bible speaks of this very eloquently in Psalm 107, that you've got a destiny that you want to go to, but there's a great storm raging against you. And you cry out in your helplessness, you cry out to God, and first God calms the storm. And then he redirects you and pulls you into the haven of your desire, where you want it to go. And he then encourages you to praise him and to tell it publicly what God has done for you. This is God's Old Testament evangelistic process. And so when you think about your pruning, what's happened to you as a material pruning that has pushed you back into the corner or hidden you or made you oppressed, an oppression captures entire nations. You know, like the Celtic nations are, are incredibly oppressed. Areas of France are incredibly oppressed. You come into Germany, unbelievably oppressed. You come into, into some of the parts of Russia, the, where, where large numbers of people gather, there is oppression. There's a sense of, well, we can't have everything physically and therefore, oh, well, just pour us. You know, we'll just take what we can get. Oh, no, no. And they end up a bunch of grumblers and moaners and complainers and, and robbers and thieves because of the oppression. And every now and again, there's a breakout from that and a new nation is born. You know, but like when the, when the Brits came over to, to 
populate America in the beginning. It was a breakout hoping for freedom to get out from underneath that oppression. And so one of the things that happens to us in the material slaughter of our hearts as kids is that we will be invariably pushed under the spirit of oppression. And you can't get that out of you by money or drinking or women or men or, you know, sex or gambling or travel or, or building up some great emporial business. You know, you, you just can't get rid of that. It will always be a part of your reflection. And it's a tormentor. And if you ever take the time to have a look at one of those things that materially oppressed you or tried to oppress you, and you see it running today, still, as it was right in the beginning. You didn't want it, but it came upon you and it oppressed you. Then you look and say, well, how can I deal with this? The spiritual way, and I praise God for the Pentecostals because they're probably the only people on earth who really developed a therapeutical approach to having a relationship with God. You know, come on down here, all of you who are feeling oppressed, and I will pray the Holy Spirit upon you, and the Holy Spirit will break that spirit off you, and you will be free. I've prayed for people like that in large conferences. I've prayed for people exactly like that, and a year later they come back and they say, you know, that thing is still off me. It's gone. It's evaporated. So when the power for pruning comes upon us in a material way, it has a reflex upon us, and it's only the power of God's spirituality which comes into our spirit that breaks it and frees us from it. And that is a purification process. You can't purify something that's already pure. You purify the thing that has already been damaged and tormented and, and bruised and shamed and criticized, criticized to the hilt and ignored and put down and rejected. The spirit of rejection is huge, a huge ministry within Christianity. You know, put your hand up if you feel rejected, you know, and all but the steward puts their hand up. You know, all the pastors got their hands up, the pastor's wives got their hands up, the kids got their hands up, you know, because the pastors have rejected them. You know. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's worse than COVID. And it kills you quicker than COVID, it kills you. Rejection. And so all of these negatives that New Age people don't like the negatives, they all like the, oh, wow, have you seen the rainbow last night? Mate, wasn't it amazing? Like, there was the sunset and there was the rainbow there right in the sunset. Mate, you know, that joy is going to last you about seven minutes. And then all of the oppression and the uglies are going to start ruling your life again. And you just keep kind of pushing them down, pushing them down. But the spirituality of Christ says... I'm your healer. And so you've got to find a way to come into that healing. And you've got to find a way for God's power to bring you in there. Because if you do it yourself, you'll run away from it. You know, you're, you're as lost as Bo Peep sheep and you've got no way of actually dealing with this stuff at all. So it's God's power to bring you in. That's why you come to a holy place like a monastery. We've got some people here at the moment who have been blown away that they've come and stayed at this place. Because it's a monastery. You go, to, you go to holy places. It's different from going and seeing some religious person that you know. It's a little bit different from that. If you go to a holy place that God's made holy, you go there and you're on God's terms now and the healing starts and stuff goes on inside of you. Most of the time, these places are really disappointing because you've said, oh, I got there and all I could think about was my father. I mean, I know, like, you know, I haven't thought about him in years. And I, and, you know, I was hoping for something really miraculous. You know, I wanted the heavens to part, and, you know, 57 angels to come down here and touch me and bring me up into the throne of God. And all I could think of was my stupid old drunk father. You know, like, but you go away and you think, gee, that was a great stay. <laughs> I don't know, there's just something changed inside of me. You know, the hidden healing of Christ purifies that which is unable to stand in the heavenly citizenship realities 
that Christ is building us into and thereby bringing us to a position where he can say, here, Father, here's your daughter, and here, Father, here's your son. He's not going to come and say, look, Father, I've got a bag full of potatoes here. Now, three quarters of it, it's rotten. You won't want to eat them, but you can make really good French fries out of the top quarter. He's not, no, 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 no. He wants to come there with a full bag of spuds and say, here you are, Father. This is your person. And so all of the stuff that is in need of being purified, if you're, if you're really stuck in theology, you'll say, oh, yes, Satan did that to me. But I tell you what, look around, and you'll find that you can probably label a person behind every one of those things that happened to you. You know, Satan was, was having popcorn at the movie theater 16 countries away from where you were at the time. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Satan. It's about people. It's human stuff. The satanic part of it comes in when all of that woundedness is used by antichrist forces for you to reject God. That's when the satanic influence comes in. But Satan doesn't have to do much at all because human beings are going to do it by themselves. Like we said, you know, like in one generation, human beings can wreck the entire planet. You know, give them three generations and it's like on the verge of irreparable. So human beings themselves have done this to you. And they've made any portion of that sack of potatoes rotten at the root. And you're saying, yeah, but look at the top ones. You know, I'm so sweet. You know, like I, am, I make the best French fries in earth. You know, like even the French would like cooking me. You know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, but do you? No, no, no. I don't want to look at the bottom. No, 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 no. That's just stuff that happened. No, no. But I can tell you that there comes a time in your life, in your spiritual life, when you've got to come to Christ or come to the Father within you with a spiritually vibrant heart that says, okay, Father, I'm going to deal with this. One by one, I want you to bring these things to mind and let's make them righteous. And I went through that process. After I came out of Buddhism and came into Christianity, that's how Christ led me. And over a two-year period, every three days, I would sit down and let my father deal with another one. You can't be swamped with this stuff. You know, you can't tip the sack of spuds upside down so all the rotten ones are on the top and the good ones are below. It's too much. You say, no, 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 keep some of the good ones up there because I've got to keep making some French fries to eat. You know, I've got, I've got to be myself. You know, I've got to, I've got to stay presentable. I can't, I, can't, like, I can't show the world that I'm three-quarters rotten spuds. You know, I've got, to, I've got to keep my face. I've got to keep doing what I'm doing. And so you make an agreement with the Father and say, okay, Father, we're going to start this process now. And it's not, I want to be purified because I really feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just slag on the welding iron. You know, it's not that. Not because you feel bad necessarily. You need a more positive approach to it. You say, Father, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a son of God, a daughter of God. I want to be, I want to start to be prepared to walk in my heavenly citizenship, Father. I want, I've got this positive drawing that's pulling me forward, Father. And this rot inside of me, this uncleanness, this impurity is getting in my way now, Father. Before I could hide it, I could deal with it, or even indulge it every now and again. You know, nothing like going down into your rot and just having an indulging week for a while, you know until you get sick and tired of it, and then you scramble up to the top of your sack again. But now you say, no, 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 I don't want any of that in me, Father. And it has to be done with a spiritual motivation, so that takes prayer. And I can remember when I started doing that, you know, so many years ago now, but when I started doing it, I said, Father, this is what I want. Walk with me for a while while I pray into this, while I get my motivation right. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to fix anything. I'm just trying to get myself into a position where I can then say to you, okay, let's go ahead and start fixing this stuff now. If you take too big a chunk out of it, it's again, you've just tipped a sack of spuds upside down and you're covered with rock. You don't want that. You've got to know yourself. You've got to know your pace. You've got to know how well you can move with God and how well you can withstand the things of God. I said to God one time, Father, 
let's, let's make a deal here. I want to be perfect as you are perfect, just like Jesus says. Just lower the whole shebang on me. And he just looked at me. He didn't laugh, but he could have. And he said, you can't stand that. I said, oh, okay. Because you don't know what you're asking for. It's like a 10-year-old kid says, hey, can I have the keys to the car tonight, Dad? <laughs> no, you can't. You know, you, if I gave them to you, you'd be killed on the road in half an hour. You forget it. You don't, you don't know how to survive. It's not about you knowing how to drive. It's you don't know how to survive yet. And so when the, when the tumult of death arrives upon you, 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 won't, you won't have any way of defending yourself. You just won't withstand it. You're too little. And so I got that. Uh, the, you're too little, I got from my father. <laughs> you're too little. And I said, okay, father, I can, I can handle that. Maybe just bring to me that which I can deal with and take your time to do that. You know, let it grow, let it grow and grow and grow and grow. And slowly you become capable of really dealing with better stuff. I've never walked away from that law yet. That law that says, I am little. And you've got big things for me, Father, but give them to me as a little person so that I can grow in them and not be swamped by them and not throw rotten spuds at you. Not curse you for giving me these things that you want me to have. God's wisdom is so impeccable. And God never, ever invites violence upon you. It's not God's will to have you crushed by your parents or some kid down the street or whatever, you know, or at school. It's never God's will for that. It's, I'm saying, that's the human stuff. But if God in your life is not particularly perfectly matched to you, you will use that material stuff to reject God. And that's why God's plan is very often incredibly secretive to be able to bring you to a point where you can turn around with a whole heart and say, God, my father, it's just you and me. My wife, Mary, used to say that all the time. She'd say, Robbie, it's just me and God. Okay, got it, man. You come to that point, it's just you and God, and you know you've got this link between you and God where you can now come to God like a parent or come to Christ like a parent, or come to the Holy Spirit like a parent. And you can say, I'm wounded. I'm hurting. I want your healing. How are you even going to know that that exists if you don't hear it from the gospel? You know, if you're, if you're Jewish, you've got to hear that down in the temple. You've got to read it. You read it in your, in your scripture. Someone's got to be able to teach you that there is spiritual hope so that you can deal with the stuff that you can now label as stuff that needs purifying. And here we've got John Climacus saying this. So this is now time to have a look at what the Father's got for you. Father, I want you to bring to mind in your child right now whether you're watching it live or you're after the fact here on this video or an audio recording of it all. Bring to mind, Father, for your child a prominent impurity that was brought upon them as children, as a child, that you want to remove and purify so that they can have their theosis more effectively and faster. Bring that to them, bring that to mind for them now, Father, because you're going to change it. And put your hand up when you've been given one. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Now I want you to, to think on that thing for a moment and think of a scale from 10 being top and 0 being 0. If you were to try and fix that yourself without asking God for any help to fix it, to cleanse it, to purify it, to get it out of your out of your way, and you're left to your psychological resources or you're left to whatever resources you happen to have. 
on a scale of 0 to 10, what do you think your chances are of doing that? And if you've got below 5, put your hand up. So you can recognize that without presence of mind and without drawing your whole being onto that and God coming in and doing something that for with that for God's purposes for your future, you got Buckley's chance of making a dent in that thing. Now, put your mind on that situation again and notice what happens here. Heavenly Father, I want you to inject into that, that memory, that scene. I want you to inject into it your version of that situation. Your holy and righteous version of that situation. The ingredients that are missing. Insert that into that situation. Now let them observe what your power in that situation does. I can pretty much guarantee you that you are feeling more complete, that you are feeling detached from it, that you are feeling humbled in it in a godly way, and that there is something that God has just done which has unhooked you from it, separated you from it, and you're looking at the person or the people involved in that thing with compassion and sort of feeling sorry for that person that they are who they are but you're okay. Put your hand up if you're getting something like that from God's... And have a... Inspect now the fundamentals of yourself. You'll notice there's no pride there. There's humility. There's thankfulness to God. And it's not gushy thankfulness. It's like, oh yeah, see, no, I'm better than you now. None of that flesh heroism there at all. There's this meekness and this humility, but you are complete. You're virginal. I, I was praying for a woman one time in a, in a big conference, and there were a number of us out the front praying for people, and people would come up when they had something that they wanted prayed for while this, this all-day conference was going on. And this woman came up to me, and she, or a young woman, she was probably 22, 23, she came up to me, and she stood in front of me, and she didn't say a word. She just stood there. And I didn't lay hands on her. I just put my hands toward her like this. And I started to pray, and I said, The Lord Jesus has sent you the Holy Spirit right now to break you right down and to give you the spirit of purity on you that makes you as pure as the Virgin Mary. And this woman collapsed at my feet but under the power of God. And I thought, oh, that, that's interesting. And so after a while, a couple of helpers came and, and moved her off and sat her on a chair, and the next person came up. and I didn't give any thought to it whatsoever. And about, and I went away on mission. I came back about, I don't know, three months later. I was back in church. And a fellow came up to me and he said, do you remember that conference that we had, the prayer conference? Remember that? There was a woman who came up to you for prayer and you prayed about the purity of the Virgin Mary. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, she collapsed. The Holy Spirit took her. He said, well, she came to me and she asked me to pass on a message to that person who prayed for her if, if, she, if, if, if he knew where that person could be. I said, yeah, I think I know the one you're talking about. He asked around and sooner or later he found me. And the young girl had come, or the young woman, had come into that meeting because she had only just started attending church, but she'd been a prostitute. She'd been damaged as a kid, well, like seriously damaged as a kid. And she started a prostitution in her early teens. Well, at, at the early age of uh, 21, 22, something like that, she started to go back into church. She just felt called to go back into church. Someone had street evangelized her. 
you know, praise God for street evangelists. They can be a pain in the neck sometimes, but when it's you that gets saved, they, you know, they're angels. So she started going to church like this, and she had this passion to be absolutely clean of everything that she had ever done sexually because it shamed her and, and it, it, it oppressed her to the nth degree. And she came along to this conference, and you only come to this conference if you do a little bit of a course in the church where you're at, and then all these churches come together, and, and there's one big meeting, one big prayer meeting like this. And we who have done it before, we are the people who are at the front praying for people as they want to come up and be prayed for. And, and, and it's mostly a deliverance ministry kind of Pentecostal meeting. And so this woman came up to this fellow and said, and the prayer that was on my heart when I came to that conference was to be able to be a friend of the Virgin Mary in her purity, you know, untouched by man. And she said, and the Holy Spirit came upon me with that man's prayer. And I just lost consciousness. I don't know where I went. But when I came up off the floor, or I was sitting on a chair when I came round, all of that stuff had just gone from me. It was like it was a part of my history, but it wasn't entangled in me any longer. And... I've, I've stayed in church ever since, but all of a sudden I, I'm worthwhile again. I'm worthy. I'm, I'm who I am. I'm, I'm back to ground zero in myself. I don't know what her actual words were, but that's what he was expressing. And so there's a purity that God sees that we should be, that he's building on day by day and experience by experience, in bringing us into our theosis, bringing us into our deification, making us God, making us a fusion between the human and the spiritual, God. Like that, God in man and man in God. That deification, that Christification, becoming like Christ. There's a purity inside of us that has never been soiled. And God's building us from that point, from ground zero in ourselves. And all of the experiences that happen to us, all of the, the rotten people who have chucked their rotten potatoes into our sack, all of that is a work that God spiritually purifies later on. And he does it in exactly the same way as what you just experienced there, where you're holding a thought, you're holding an image of that thing. And God comes into that thing and spiritualizes it. And my way of doing it, I, I know exactly what I'm talking about here because I've done years of this. My way of doing that was I asked my father, what, what's the process here? And he said, I will bring to mind for you one of your sins. And this is what sin is. Sin is basically rotten potatoes that hold you against God. That's, that's it, you know, and... You've got to ask yourself, well, how many rotten potatoes did you yourself create? Well, most of the time in the beginning, they're thrown upon you. But it doesn't take too long before you are creating your own rotten potato mash. You know, it's just that's what they say. The world is sinful because we have got horror and terror and shame and oppression put upon us. It doesn't take too long before we are regurgitating that and say, well, I'm entitled to that. You know, I'm allowed to do that. We give ourselves permission to be something disgusting that our purity doesn't really get a vote on. Our purity just gets covered over. But God is building us from that purity position called personality. That's the unchangeable thing inside of us, personality. And God builds on our personality. And as he builds on it, he takes away our right to refuse healing. And he puts inside of us the joy of accepting healing, accepting work into our material pruning so that we can become a more glorified spiritual being. 
And when you are, yeah, let's do that one, Father. Right now, I want you to think of the most innocent time you can think of as a kid. When you were the sweetest little rascal you could ever be. Think of that time. Now, Heavenly Father, I want you to put your spiritual glow into that person. Just so they know, this is the embryo. Now, put your hand up if you're feeling pretty good about that kind of a person that you are. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's the true, it's the true you. And then if you put a pipeline in front of you that goes 10 meters in front of you, you know, 10 yards in front of you, that is all of your life from that point on. And it's all kind of black and white horror stories mixed in every now and again with a few victories. You think, I really don't want to walk into that. I want to stay this kind of person that I am. But as you walk into that, as you move into that, the thing that Jesus says is that after the fact, I can come back and I can deal with that experience that you had and build up the spirituality on this purity that you are. And I can do that through that whole green mile ahead of you that's full of all of these nasties that come at you. I can come in and I can purify by spiritualizing you and your response gets remade in each of those situations. Then you can say, oh, Lord, but I've had 100,000 of those things. You're never going to be able to do that. But for the believer, everything's possible with God. This is why I'm saying if you've got God's spiritual motivation in you to say, I want my theosis, I want my deification, and nothing's going to stand in the way of that, your deification is not finding out about more of God. That's not your deification. Your deification starts with you getting rid of all of the rotten potatoes in your sack. And the way to do that is for Christ to come in or the Father to come in or the Holy Spirit to come in. The Trinity comes in and identifies one of these situations and spiritualizes you in that situation. And it has the impact of spiritualizing the very core nexus of that reality inside of you, that behavior pattern that's in your subconscious, that's just waiting to be used at some point of pressure in your life, when you're pressured to do something. It's just waiting there. And if you reckon you've got 100,000 rotten spuds in your sack, then you've got 100,000 of these things waiting to be used. And if you say, yeah, but can't we just get rid of those? You know, look, you know, put them off to the side and just deal with me who's such a lovely person these days. Well, the truth is you're not. The truth is that back you into the corner now and you will not throw righteousness out. You will reach for buckets of those rotten spuds and throw them out because that's who you are. That is what you are. And all that you've learned about God isn't going to save you from that. As John Climacus here says, it is impossible for snow to burst into flame. Still more difficult is it for humility to dwell in an unorthodox person, a sack full of rotten spuds. This is something which the pious and faithful achieve, those who are connected to God, and then only when they have been purified. And so there comes a time where you stop wanting to find out about God and you're comfortable. Yeah, okay, God exists. God's real. God's got 70,000 universes and heavens and yada, 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 yada. But so what? I'm still a sack full of rotten potatoes. There comes this point where by God's energy, you turn into yourself so that you can deal with this stuff God's way and be purified and be sanctified, says my father, be set apart for the holy trail. If you're not set apart from the world for the holy trail of your theosis, the world will keep filling up your sack with rotten muck. You've got to be set apart. 
Now, there's an anointing that does that. There's a power of God that does that. And it did it for Jesus. And Jesus did it with his apostles. And his apostles did it for everybody else. And that was baptism. Baptism had that initial thrust into the holiness of the set-apart life. But, you know, give it a couple of weeks and a rotten pastor at your church, and sooner or later the, the glitz wears off. You've got, you know, like, yeah, well, I've been here two years and nothing's happened to me. I might as well have stayed on my motorbike and joined the Hells Angels. You know, like, what the heck? Nothing's really changed. But God's got an anointing, a power anointing. And my father has just gone off to get a couple of characters to bring that in to you right now. Holy Spirit connected to the Father, connected to Christ the Son that enables the desire for purification. You know, if you've ever gone to a really sacred cathedral or you've gone off to some sacred mountain or you've gone off to some place where you know God has called you to that place, when you come in, you feel the power of God on you right now. This is what this is what the Father has just brought into our presence for this purpose. When you go off to this sacred place, you can feel somehow you are set apart from the world and you are set apart for God's glory. You're set apart for being the instrument of God's plans for holiness and for, for righteousness and for goodness to be right across the whole world, the whole, whole all of creation even. You, you, you sense that. And if you're pressured and you have to leave, you don't want to leave that place because you're in this anointing and it's a holiness anointing. And this anointing turns your heart so that you want what God wants. Now, there's a permanency of that anointing. And it comes to rest on the religious. It comes to rest on those who are spiritually committed. It can't stay on the enthusiast who's not committed. As he says here, it can't dwell in the unorthodox person, the person who's still got the tendency to spit up venom and to throw rotten apples and rotten spuds back into the world. It can't stay on that person. Because the person's still unpurified enough to have this anointing take root in them. And it's only of the spirit. There's nothing material in it whatsoever. Now, if you've got faith to receive this, the permanency of the purifying anointing of God, that brings and makes available to you those things that you can say to the Father, Father, make this righteous in me, which is what he said to me. I will raise up an idea for you every three days, and you can say, Father, make this righteous in me, and I will. And in this way, your sack full of spuds quickly starts bringing up first the, the more palatable rotten spuds, the ones that are easy to deal with. Then after a while, a few real gut wrenches come up and then some really solid ones right from the first seven years of your life start coming up. Foundational ones start coming up. And at that point, you realize, glory to God, you, God, my Father, you are creating in me a being capable of walking in the heavens. You are creating in me my heavenly being. I'm not just spiritual, but you are, cre you are recreating me. And he will then point to this original point, ground zero inside of you and say, I'm building on the purity that you are. No human being is ever born as sin. You are born pure. But sinful, rotten spuds are thrust upon you. The Father's always got his eyes on this pure being. And it, that's why it's so easy to evangelize somebody. I remember Robert being out in the middle of the night with his enchiladas and his 
He's going around these people and he's speaking to them from the innocence of a pure heart. And it touches these guys, touches these women, because God's there and God is immediately touching ground zero in these people. It's how God makes it so easy for everybody. Everybody's got a ground zero in their personality, and God builds on that. So right now, if you've got the faith to believe for an anointing of God, that perpetually puts you over the 50% mark of enthusiasm for being purified by God and being made the righteousness of God and that that's working in your life and it's unstoppable. It's of the Spirit. It's of God. The world cannot stop it. If you've got the faith for receiving that right now, then I'm going to simply command it to begin and notice what happens inside of you will it be that you notice the holy spirit come upon you from outside of you will it be that something inside of you raises up and i dare any dragon inside of you to raise up and say no you're not coming in here because you're going to get slaughtered immediately the dragon the power of god's holiness and the power of god's righteousness is God's power for making you pure for your theosis. And God's plan is the inevitability of your theosis. Heavenly Father, in all the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son of Man, let this anointing for purification, for pruning, the positive-mindedness of pruning, Let it now come out of heaven and be in each of your children here in the room, here overseas, and here after the fact on this video. Bring it now, Lord. Bring it now. And Heavenly Father, I want you to redesign some behavior patterns now so that in each of your children, listening to this and watching this, each of your children can have two or three behavior patterns to select from in their, in their daily life where they can mobilize this anointing deliberately in their consciousness that it's not just something working in their unconscious, their out of conscious and in their spirit, but that they can mobilize this against something happening in their life or even in their prayer life. If they see something bitter root in themselves, they can turn themselves to this bitter root and say, no, I have got the power for purity of Christ inside of me and I'm coming against you right now, Lord. My Heavenly Father, come against this. Turn this to my righteousness, please. Really simple process. So, Heavenly Father, make two or three or four or five behavior patterns for each of your children. And as you work with them, bring to mind these patterns when they need them until they can bring them to mind themselves and they can walk as an orthodox person, as someone who is on the path in their theosis, actively, creatively, positively, powerfully. Now, Heavenly Father, I'd like you to bring to mind five things that the power of purification can address right now. And all you've got to do is prompt your child right now so that they can count with their fingers. Oh yeah, here's one. I don't even know the ins and outs of it, but there's one. Oh yeah, here's a second one. There's a third one, Father, thank you. There's a fourth one. Hey, there's a fifth one. Oh, they're queuing up. No, well, okay, there's a sixth one. Yeah, there's, there's, there's 10 of them, Father. Just count them off with your fingers. I'm only asking for five. 
that the Father is identifying in you can be purified right now, that will mature your theosis better and faster and more solidly because of this new anointing that he's put inside of you through the Holy Spirit in Christ's name. Count them off on your fingers. Thank you, Father. Now I want you to turn your attention to that handful that you're holding up there and say, my Heavenly Father, I want you to make these righteousness inside of me. Purify them. Cleanse me of them. Free me from them. Anoint me with your theosis faith. And free me from these five things. And notice how he does that. You might have to open your mouth and have a bit of a breath out at some point to let some of these little demons come out of you. And now, Father, settle them down into their point zero personality as someone who is on the pathway of theosis with you. Bring them back into their sublime humility, Father, that is the destroyer of the passions. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you're not in a better, stronger, healthier, more pure version of your humility than even at the start of this one hour. This is that power of anointing. That is the power of God's anointing. God has power to make pure so that the root humility is who we are. Now, um, I've got to insist on this because I actually wanted to read point 35. <laughs> We've been dwelling on point 32. So let's just have a read of 34. Robert, could you read 34 for us, please? <clears throat> he who had, who is hastening to that tranquil arbor of humility will never cease to do all that he can and will drive himself on by worlds and thoughts and afterthoughts and various means by, work, um, by investigations and researches and by his whole life by prayer prayers and supplication, meditating and reflection, and using all imaginable means until, with God's help, and by abiding in humiliations in the most despised condition, and by toils, he delivers the ship of his soul from the ever-recurring storms of the sea of vainglory. For he who is de delivered from his sin, from this sin, he is easily pardoned all the rest of his sins, like the publican in the gospel. Yeah, I, I, I would reckon you'd have to say an amen about that, based on amen. where you are right now. So let's have a look at that point number 35. Jordan, can you uh, um, give us a read on point 35, please? Yep, no worries. There are some who all their lives use the bad deeds previously done by them, and for which they had received forgiveness as the motive for humility, thereby driving out the vain self-esteem. Others having in mind Christ's passion regard themselves always as that is. Others hold themselves cheap for their daily defects. Others as the result of their besetting temptations, infirmities, and sins have mortified their pride. Others for want of grace have appropriated the mother of graces, i.e. humility, 
there are also people, if they still exist, for who the sake of the very gifts of God, in the measure that they receive them, humble themselves and so live as to account themselves unworthy of such wealth, and each day add it to their debt. Such is humility, such is beatitude, such is the perfect reward. It's a nice statement, isn't it? So with that, uh, we'll, we'll finish off um, with humility. We'll have a break next uh, week for the summer break. And then um, we'll come back and we'll look at step 26, which uh, is on discernment. And we've then got 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So we're five steps to the completion of John's ladder. The interesting thing I want to say about John's ladder, because I'm writing about it in one of the books I'm writing at the moment, is that it can appear that you're, you're climbing these steps one by one, that one step leads to the next, and that, that step leads to the next, and so forth. But it's a bit of an illusion, because what you'll find is that all of these steps are within each step. The humility that you have now, if you look back on it, it's actually in the first step. And the first step is renunciation of the world. Well, Heavenly Father, right now, give your child a sense of their own renunciation of the world, their own detachment from the world. Just give them a sense of that right now, Lord. And now, Father, reveal humility in that. And you see how humility is actually the strength of it. <laughs> it's the root of it. And if you come to any of the other steps, you'll find humility is actually the very root that makes it happen. Humility is of God. It's of the nature of God. It's the essence of God, not the essence. It's the, it's the character of God. And so when we... If next week, if you're not doing anything and you want to take a look, you know, open up, open up the ladder of divine ascent, open up the book, and and just dwell on each of the steps, just for a moment, and say, Father, reveal humility to me in this step. And with every single step, you'll find that humility is it's hidden, it's covered over, it's like it's not really there because, um, you know, the stomach is kind of like predominant. But wait until God's power reveals humility in it and you'll find that humility is the root power in every one of these steps. And that it, it isn't just a ladder where you climb each step and, and you get to the next one and finally you get to 30 so you can throw the whole ladder away now. And it's not like that at all. It's drawn like that because of the old way of thinking about things back in those days. But by the time you start to come into the essence of humility, you now have been given the provision by God to recognize that every one of those steps is in each other. And it's actually like a flat earth all of a sudden. It's a rubric of um, everything mixed in through everything else. And this is the character of God. But the root power of it, from the human point of view, is God's humility. God is the most humble person ever. And that's your victory. If you've got a bad situation coming up or an, you know, an unfortunate situation coming up like this, if you trust to walk with God, the humble one, you'll find that God has got this pathway through that thing that just, you could never see it coming. It's just, it's like hot knife through butter. It's like, how did this, how did this exist? Like, it just, the world just falls away. It's like the dividing of the Red Sea. It's it, the parting of the Red Sea. It just falls away. You think, how did I do this? And that's because everything is strung together tightly. Nothing strung together humbly. And so humility has got a free passage. <laughs> it just goes where it wants. 
because everything else is so bound up. But humility and the humble path, it's got a, it's got a wide open universe. <laughs> Try it this week. If you've got something like, you know, you've got something really absolutely horrible coming your way, just say with the Father, say, Father, I want you to walk with me, walk in my steps. Let me, let me walk into your footsteps before your steps even, your foot's even left your footstep. Let me walk that closer with you, Father. And let me walk the way of humility. And what you'll find is that it's restorative, it's cleansing, it's purifying you, and it's letting you be ground zero personality in yourself pure person in yourself and you'll just cruise on through this thing and then you'll realize the power of renunciation of the world you'll realize the power of detachment you'll realize the power of humility because it's now being acted in your life it's it's a no a no brainer with god it's not to say god's got no brain but the chances are pretty good he's got no brain because our brains get so tangled up in everything don't they anyway this is uh, humility we're done with humility. We're going to move on now to discernment, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. But all the glory be to God. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You're going to watch the, want to watch this a few times, I can tell. <laughs> As it was in the beginning, this now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So if there's anything that you want to do therapeutically, just watch this thing. You know, pause it at the point where I start talking about God's anointing, God's what God's doing, and just revisit that over and over and over again with whatever your issues are until it becomes, oh yeah, this is, I know how to do this. This is really easy, and you and God can do it. And it's like, it's truly a two minute process. But don't do millions of things at once. Just do the most important ones at the time. Let God just bring it to you. You know, bring up just. One rotten potato at a time, two, three, five rotten potatoes at a time. Never, never a whole colander full of rotten potatoes. Just one or two at a time, and you'll get in the habit of this. And after a year, well, not even a year. After about nine months for me, it happened like this. I would find some rotten motivation in me, or some decision I was about to make come up in me. And I would just, I wouldn't even process it any longer. I'd just say to the Father, Father, your righteousness. That's it. And done. Because you get into this habit of working so closely with God that all it takes is now the smell of the process, the thought of the process is enough. And God does it in the background underneath. And very quickly you find that your sack of spuds, all the rotten ones, are gone. And you might be left with just a handful, half a dozen, really glowing, wonderful spuds. But for you, ah, oh, it's more than enough. <laughs> it's more than enough. <laughs> All right. I love you. Ciao. God bless. Have a great week. Have a great fortnight. And if you've got time next week, have a look through the, uh, the uh, ladder. Look at all of these steps. And ask God to reveal humility in each of them. Just so you get an idea of the whole holographic nature of the ladder of divine ascent itself. Okay, ciao. Love you. God bless.